This is Jimmy Carolani. Jimmy is Bajau, one of the 175 different ethno-linguistic groups that call the Philippines home. Like many people in the Philippines, fishing is Jimmy's livelihood. Unlike most of those fishers, however, Jimmy practices a time-honored form of Bajau fishing that requires incredible physical discipline and skill, free dive spear fishing. Jimmy has trained himself to stay underwater for up to five minutes at a time, prowling the ocean floor in search of his prey. He relies on the ocean and its ecosystem for his living, as do most of the inhabitants of his village, whether or not they fish directly. They might be involved in cleaning or selling, or they might own a small cafe that sells meals to fishers once the fishers' work is done. This is Aslat Yan Landsman. Aslat Yan is a member of the Sami ethnic group, an indigenous group that ranges across the northernmost regions of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. You may have heard them referred to as Laps or Laplanders. Aslat Yan is a reindeer herder. In the longer documentary, we find out that 1965 was a big year in the life of the Sami because that was the year snowmobiles arrived and made their lives much, much easier. Before snowmobiles, they traveled and worked like Santa, following a team of reindeer. Roughly 10% of the Sami people are involved in reindeer herding, grazing their herds across the snowy tundra and boreal forest of northern Europe. Finally, this is Morgan Atkinson, a rancher from right here in southwestern Colorado. In this photo, she's doing a modified version of what the kids used to call ghost riding the whip, allowing her truck, Sands Driver, to slowly idle across the range while dropping off hay to keep the herd fed during the natural grasslands dormant season. What do these three people from very different parts of the world have in common, besides having jobs that seem mercifully free of Zoom meetings? They are all examples of livelihoods that are clearly coupled to their natural environment. They depend heavily on ecosystem services, the many and varied benefits to humans gifted by the natural environment and from healthy ecosystems, and in turn shape that natural environment in intentional and unintentional ways. And in turn, that environment shapes human activity in myriad ways. In this lecture, We'll introduce the concept of coupled natural and human systems. We'll discuss their characteristics and provide a variety of examples. These examples will be useful for you when you begin to think about a coupled natural human system and put together your own diagram. In brief, coupled natural human systems, also known as CHANs, ICs, CHESS, SES, etc., are complex multiscalar interactions between human systems and natural systems that are coupled, i.e. linked dynamically via reciprocal feedbacks in which processes in the human system affect processes in the natural system, and vice versa. This concept was really forwarded and synthesized in a 2007 paper in Science, authored by, among others, Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom and former National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Administrator Jane Lubchenco. Let's start with the natural system. The natural system is a community of living organisms in conjunction with the non-living components of their environment, interacting as a system. For example... A coral reef ecosystem is composed of interactions between coral, fish and crustacean species, microscopic organisms, plants, and the non-living water in which they exist. Imagine humans didn't exist. The normal comings and goings of this system would be a sealed natural system. Now let's talk about a human system, a system of interactions between humans whose actions are interdependent. What one person does is contingent on the actions and choices of others, and vice versa. An economy is an example of a human system. Interactions around the production, distribution, and trade, as well as consumption of goods and services by different actors, be they people, firms, or governments. Couplings refer here to the effects of the systems have on one another. In the example of a fishery, the coupling from the human to natural system might be fishing effort, trying to catch fish. And the feedback from the natural system to the human system would be fish catch, i.e. the volume of fish caught per unit of effort. Processes refer to mechanisms by which components of the subsystem affect one another, whereas conditions refer to the steady states, a level of abundance of a species in an ecosystem, or a level of human activity, that are disturbed or changed by processes in the system. Conditions refer to the temporary outcomes associated with these interactions. For example, the livelihoods and any given level of fishing effort and fish catch provide as a function of interactions in the human and natural systems. Now, this can be a lot to take in, so we'll spend the next few minutes describing the relevant attributes of a coupled natural human system, what I'll now call CNH systems, that are particularly relevant for our understanding. First, reciprocal effects and feedback loops. Second, nonlinearity and or threshold effects. Three, surprises. Four, legacy effects and lags. Five, resilience. Six, heterogeneity. And finally, seven, couplings across spatial and actor scales.
Let's start with reciprocal effects and feedback loops, which are a pretty intuitive concept. This is an example of a positive feedback loop, where the reciprocal effects amplify one another over time. Global warming amplifies deforestation through forest fires and decreasing agricultural productivity, incentivizing further deforestation to clear land for increased agricultural production. This deforestation results in more carbon emissions, the second largest source of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is increasing the frequency of wildfires and decreasing agricultural productivity, leading to further deforestation. The next important concept is threshold effects, or nonlinearities and discontinuities in relationships between variables or components of the system. For example, this figure shows the relationship between fish habitat, so logs per kilometer, logs are what are known as fish aggregators, fish are attracted to them for marking locations and mating activity, and housing density along lake shores in northern Wisconsin. Below 10 houses per kilometer, housing density doesn't seem to affect the abundance of fish habitat at all. Above it, fish habitat decreases in a mostly linear way as a function of housing density. More houses, less habitat. Similar thresholds are often found in animal populations. Often, once a critical point in terms of catch is passed, for instance in a fishery, the population is no longer able to regenerate itself and can be trapped in a low population equilibrium, as happened to the North Atlantic cod, for decades. The Atlantic cod fishery off the shores of Newfoundland was once one of the most productive and economically valuable in the North Atlantic Ocean. By the early 1960s, the fishery had been sustainably harvested for over 100 years by small-scale local fishers and migratory fleets. In the 1960s, larger industrial fishing vessels began trawling the waters, leading catch to nearly triple in less than a decade. However, These large catches undermine the ability of the fish to reproduce, ultimately causing the population to collapse by the early 1990s. And to this day, the fishery has never rebounded to its pre-1960 level of productivity, leaving smaller-scale local fishers largely out of work. Surprises mean that CNH systems often produce very unintended consequences. The primary outcome is usually not at all what had originally been intended. The English settlers who introduced rabbits to Australia did not intend for them to ravage the local ecosystem. They intended for them to be a food source and game for sport hunting. But introducing them into an ecosystem in which they had no natural predators, and the remaining ones, most of which were in the process of being eradicated to make the land safe for sheep, and converting rangeland into farmland with nicely tended food crops, the Australian rabbit population exploded to the point that by 1859, 2 million could be killed annually without having any noticeable effect on the population. To date, it was the fastest spread ever recorded of any mammal anywhere in the world and resulted in a mass extinction of local species due to loss of habitat. Legacy effects and lags refer to the ways human interventions in the natural system, often long in the past, have large, often unanticipated effects for the current state of the system. For example, kudzu was introduced to the southern United States as an ornamental plant and a fast-growing ground cover for livestock, primarily goats, and to control erosion. Boll weevil infestations and failed cotton crops caused farmers to abandon fields and allow kudzu to spread rapidly, changing the landscape of the U.S. South and outcompeting many native plants. The legacy of the past attempts to solve past problems, like erosion, affect current human interactions with the environment in a variety of ways. Heterogeneity is perhaps the simplest feature to understand. Like snowflakes, no two CNH systems are exactly alike. They are as diverse as they are similar. Resilience is the capacity to retain a system's structure and functioning after disturbances. That is, their potential to rebound or snap back after a big shock. Different systems can be more or less resilient. The aforementioned cod fishery was not particularly resilient. It hasn't rebounded in 30 years, even when released largely from human harvesting. Meanwhile, the West Coast rockfish fishery was similarly devastated due to overfishing, but has rebounded nicely in the 2010s after a temporary fishing moratorium was put in place, perhaps due to the fundamental differences in the fish, cod versus rockfish, themselves as organisms. Let's return for a second to our friend kudzu. Kudzu is also useful for illustrating couplings across scales, in this case spatial, from highly local to highly diffused, which feed back into local effects. While kudzu infestation has dramatic effects for the local environment, its effects extend further, even to the level of the global climate. Eradication programs rely largely on controlled burns, which emit large amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, and the plant itself, due to its high rate of nitrogen fixing, that is the rate at which it pulls nitrogen from the air to stimulate growth, and as a result, 
um, local nitrous oxide emissions from land that is burned are on average 100% higher than non-invaded soils. That's bad. These carbon emissions and ozone pollution, and the warmer winters that have come with them, may be part of the reason the natural range of the plant has been begun spreading north. The plant that ate the south, as it's been called, is currently eating its way up the Ohio River Valley. To recap, coupled natural and human systems are complex, multiscalar interactions between natural systems, or ecosystems, and the humans that interact with them. They shape and are shaped by one another, and are characterized by seven attributes. Reciprocal effects and feedback loops, nonlinearity and or threshold effects, surprises, legacy effects and lags, resilience, heterogeneity, and couplings across spatial and actor scales. In our next lecture, we will look at one CNH system in particular, the interactions between human conflict and fisheries in the Lake Victoria Basin.